Hi friends, I'm Gio. I have fun writing gay fiction. Come join me. We're on chapter 5 of Speeding. What's happening? Ethan is gay, an ambulance driver, and a minimalist. He's also in love with Pete. Pete is straight, works at an IT center, and is a hoarder. Because of the problem his hoarding is causing, he's about to be evicted. His mom is very domineering and has set up a blind date for her son without even asking him about it. Let's get started. Friday, August 5th. Pete. Twenty-six days left. I arrived at work, barely on time, and pulled into a spot sandwiched between a van and an old boat of a car. I would have been here earlier, but the clothes I had washed last weekend smelled like rotten potatoes, and the bottom shirts were a little damp. Had I spilled something? An old drink cup, maybe? Or knocked a cup of water over while I slept? Now I had nothing but dirty, stinky clothes. It took me a moment to find one that didn't smell and wasn't too wrinkled. Welcome to the job I wish I didn't have. Customer service, Sinclair Appliance IT. I took a seat at my overflowing cubicle and placed the Employee of the Month trophy on a mound towards the rear of my desk so it wouldn't fall off the edge. My cubicle and desk easily held a couple thousand things, most of it papers and notes from the previous times I had helped customers. Ethan only kept 200 things. I could never do that. He only kept the things he used. According to him, people only used a fraction of what they owned. That's crazy. He's crazy. Most of the desks around me were as messy as mine. They didn't have as much stuff on theirs, but they weren't that much different. Besides, who had time to clean their desk? Well, there's Ralph in the corner and Wade on the far side and Colleen three cubicles down from mine. Colleen, the lady who had one employee of the month last month. Her desk was always clean. Time to put Ethan to the test, and then I'll tell him how wrong he is. My desk might be covered with piles of papers, but they were all important papers. I went to the coffee machine. Beside it were a dozen boxes filled with reams of paper. I emptied one, refilled the photocopy machine and the network printer with some of the extra paper, and took the empty box back to my desk. I'll prove Ethan wrong. I put everything on my desk, except my phone, my computer, the trophy, a pad of paper, my logbook, and a couple of pens, into the box. I dumped out my desk drawer into the box as well. As I was doing that, the first call came in. Sinclair Appliance IT, my name's Pete. How may I help you today? I said. An older woman spoke. I just bought a new microwave and I can't set the clock. Let me get some information, ma'am, and I would be happy to walk you through it. Tell me the year and model, ma'am, I said. The call lasted three minutes, and when I finished, I typed in a few notes and filled out the logbook. It would be much easier to only type it in the computer, but management wanted the logbook. It didn't matter what anybody said. Management was old school that way. The person who had set up our call system had set it up so we had 30 seconds between calls to finish updating the computer. The call was so easy I had time to spare. I finished cleaning the drawer and put it back. The next call. I bought one of those coffee makers and the directions came in some other language. How do I set the timer so I get fresh coffee first thing when I wake up? Let me get some information, I said, and I typed his information in the computer and quickly filled out the logbook as we spoke. It was like that until lunch, and the only thing I pulled out of the box was a stapler so I could staple some notes I'd taken into the logbook. Stapler and staples went into my desk. I guess I needed those. Just after lunch, I had some dead time. I reached into the box and pulled out one paper. 
It was notes on a washing machine case from a week ago, and its case number. I pulled up the file on the computer. I had already typed those notes in, so the paper was useless. I crumpled up the paper and tossed it into the trash can. Note to self, the trash can is useful. Every time I had 30 seconds or so, I checked on one of the papers in the box. Most were notes that I had already typed into the computer. A couple were old memos, meeting agendas, and some procedure changes. I found a work order from Tuesday for somebody's dishwasher that I had forgotten to turn in. I printed out the accompanying documentation, stapled the papers together, and walked them to my manager. He was too busy to notice the date. I'd almost screwed up that one. By the end of the day, the box was one quarter empty. I quickly looked through it to make sure there were no more work orders. Besides the stapler and staples, I'd used a paper clip and had to search to find a paper with a code list for different parts of the software we used. I taped that on my cubicle wall. Tape was useful, so I put that on my desk. Besides my computer, phone, pens, the trophy, stapler, pad of paper, tape, and my printer, I hadn't needed anything else. Check at our overachiever, Jocelyn, the woman in the cubicle over from mine, said. Your desk looks really organized. Are you sick? Somebody's letting the employee of the month trophy go to his head, Ralphie said. I bet a cup of coffee you can't keep your desk clean for a week. If I keep my desk clean for a week, you'll buy me a coffee? Deal. A large frappuccino from Java Dive with cinnamon sprinkled on top, I said. That sounds good, but next Friday you'll lose, and you'll owe me a frap with shaved chocolate on top, Ralph said. I wrote a note on the pad of paper to remind me of the bet and taped it on my computer screen. This would be an easy way to get a cup of coffee. When quitting time came, I scanned the box for anything else I could have used today. Extra pens would always come in handy, but I was too tired to think of anything else. I spent a moment doing something I had rarely done. I tidied my desk, put my pad of paper, the pens, the tape, and the stapler inside my empty desk drawer. It made me smile. Monday. I'll show Ethan how wrong he is. It looks good. I always suspected there was a neat, unorganized person inside you screaming to get out, Colleen said, walking past me. Me? A neat, unorganized person? I chuckled as a little warm pride filled my chest. I slid the box under my desk, gave my logbook to the secretary, and walked to my car, grinning. When was the last time somebody had called me neat and organized? Today was probably a fluke, and Monday I'd find I'd need all the stuff in the box. Ethan was crazy, but with his job, maybe he had to live like this. When would he have time to clean? One day on shift, one day for sleep, one day for chores. I could never handle his schedule, except for the sleep part. I drove home from work, actually liking my job. In a strange way, I had fun playing the game of what do I use. If I got another box, I could do the same with my car. How many times had people looked into my car? All someone had to do was break in, lift the blanket, and they'd find old takeout boxes, computer manuals, books, some video games, and my old dead laptop. Anything I didn't use, I could throw away or store in my apartment. My messed up disaster of an apartment. The happy day I just had turned into a major bout of depression. No matter how I looked at my apartment or my life, I saw no way to fix it and no way to trust anyone with my problems. I had 26 days until I'm evicted, a blind date tomorrow night Mom had set up in spite of my plans, and Mom must be furious with me, because I hadn't talked to her since Wednesday. How often did Ethan's mom call him? Mom would be on my doorstep any day now screaming at me because I hadn't talked to her. Did any other guy have a mom who wouldn't let their kids grow up? Ethan was so lucky he didn't have my life. 
I didn't deserve a friend like him. Ethan had trusted me with part of his soul, and I had almost let him down. Why couldn't I trust him? Why didn't I trust anyone? Why can't I let anyone in? Because I am ashamed. The old despair threatened to overwhelm me. I sat in my car, feeling like a piece of crap, waiting for the red light to change to green. I couldn't trust anyone. Not my best friend. Not my friends. Not my landlord. Especially not my family. I was alone. When I got home, I pulled into my parking space and bravely walked to my front door and opened it. The disaster of my life greeted me. The only good thing that had happened lately... Ethan had forgiven me. We were still friends. But what would happen if he ever saw my place? Look at Ethan. He's perfect. Once he saw how I lived, why would he want to have anything to do with me? Why would anyone? Turning around, I walked to the mailbox kiosk and picked up my mail. I walked to my apartment and forced myself to walk in. I set the mail and Ethan's 200 list on the stack of unopened mail, and the eviction notice went by it. I didn't turn the lights on because then I would see my apartment. I checked messages on my phone. One missed message from the bank Mom worked at. A good son loves his mother, so answer your phone and act like it. I'm your mother. You still haven't called Cindy, so you will do it right now. Don't disappoint she yelled. After taking a deep breath, I deleted the message without listening to the rest of it. When will Mom stop bugging me? I collapsed on my couch and stared at the ceiling for half an hour. When I got tired of being depressed in my living room, I wandered out the front door, casually glancing at each car. The green Ford had old drink cups and takeout wrappers. The silver Honda had old textbooks. The red Chevrolet had tinted windows, so I couldn't tell what was in it. The green Hyundai had somebody's security pass, sunglasses, and a baby bottle. And a laptop in the back seat. Ethan was right. A parking lot was a shopping mall for a thief. I took a trash can out to my car and sifted through the junk on my back seat. How had I collected so much garbage? I can't do this. I give up. If I did nothing, Linda would evict me and sue me, and I'd be homeless. There had to be something I could do. How could anybody own only 200 things? Ethan was insane. I had that easily in clothes, most of which I used as a carpet or were stuffed in garbage bags. What would I do with all my clothes? I pushed my way through all the stacked boxes, the piles of clothes, the lumps of garbage bags, and into the kitchen. I hadn't seen my bedroom in months. Access to the utility closet was next to the bedroom closet, so maintenance hadn't seen my bedroom in months either. I grabbed an overstuffed garbage sack from the counter and ran it to the dumpster. One garbage bag down, dozens to go. Then I stacked dishes in the dishwasher and ran a load. The kitchen didn't look any different. This was hopeless. I'd better find a big shopping cart and see what I can fit in it. Three mice were eating the garbage that had spilled the other day, and one stared at me. I stepped over them and took the second bag to the dumpster. Two bags down. A hundred to go. Success. I found a new garbage bag and began picking up the spilled trash from the kitchen floor. It included an old takeout container that smelled like vomit. The mice avoided it. Smart mice. It stunk. Bad. My stomach heaved. I can't do this. It's too much. I leaned on a stack of boxes. They wobbled, and I quickly stood away. I don't need them falling down. I went back to my couch, found my controller and headset, and turned on my computer and connected online. I found a group to join and shot aliens for a while. My doorbell rang. Pete, it's Linda for management. We're coming in, she yelled. It was after six? Why would she still be here? Just a minute, I yelled back. Can she visit any apartment that she wanted? 
I guess so, because she'd been here the other day evaluating my place. I answered the door. Behind Linda were a man and a woman dressed in blue jeans and white T-shirts. On the left side of the T-shirt was a small emblem that said, Stuff Be Gone, Professional Cleaners. The woman gasped and placed a hand over her mouth and nose. The smell! How can anyone live here? Good, Pete. You waited for me. I'm sorry I'm late, Linda said, also holding a hand over her mouth and nose. Late? For what? What's this about? I asked. I sent you a letter on Wednesday informing you that I'd be here tonight, though we are later than we planned, Linda said. That would be our fault, the man said. We ran into some trouble at our previous job. As I said in the letter, I'm getting bids from cleanup crews about how much it would cost to clean up your apartment, Linda said. Stuff be gone is the first one. But you gave me a month, I said. And I'm sure you're using your time wisely, she said, nodding at the game I was playing. But do you have the right to enter like this? I asked. When it involves the safety and maintenance of the unit, of my complex, my tenants, and is within normal business hours, I do. I also gave you advance notice, which you'll find when you check your mail, she said, and glanced at the stack of unopened mail by the door. After taking a ragged breath, I opened the door and let them in. It took Stuff Be Gone fifteen minutes to look through my apartment, measure the walls as best they could, measure the height of some of the stacks, and take a thousand pictures. The man made some notes in a notebook. Linda, I'll send you an email estimate within a couple of days. But I estimate this job will need four trucks, maybe five, because we can't see what's in the bedroom. Each load will cost $800, which will include a four-man crew, a driver who will haul away the trash and dump it at the landfill, plus appropriate dumping fees. We're looking at a potential four grand, then another grand to clean and sanitize this place, another 500 to clean the carpets and steam clean the tile. Will that get rid of the smell? Linda asked. I hardly smell anything, I said. The stuff begun woman spoke through her hand, covering her mouth. It's bad. Be professional, please. The man nodded and made some notes in a small notebook. It smells like a mold problem. Linda, I recommend you have someone from Disaster Relief look at it. We cleaned up a place recently where they had to tear down the drywall, sanitize and seal the wood braces, and rebuild the wall. That could cost an additional several grand, depending on how much they have to replace. As for us, we can schedule you for Monday the 15th? Hold on a minute. There's some valuable things here, I said. Not with all the damage the mice have caused, the woman said. We'll need new carpet, definitely an exterminator, and a complete repainting, Linda said. Linda, you gave me until the end of August, I said. I did which will give me time to schedule the other bids, she said, and then turned to the man from Stuff Be Gone. I'll be expecting your bid, and I'll get back to you after I've gotten two more bids. I appreciate you stopping by. I'll be homeless and broke in 26 days. My phone buzzed, an incoming text. It's probably Ethan texting about the game tomorrow. I looked. It wasn't Ethan. My stomach shriveled. It was from Cindy Wilson. Not again. Smiley face emoji. Your mom said you were in the hospital visiting a sick friend. Sad face emoji. Hope all is well. Can't you send me a picture so I know who to look for? Can't wait for tomorrow night. String of smiley face emojis and hearts. I wanted to text, leave me alone. Pete, Linda said, and gave me a sad smile. Maybe you should invite Cindy over to help you clean rather than going on a date. Why did I feel so trapped? Saturday, August 6th, Pete. Did you see that shot? Ethan yelled, strutting and boasting. It was from way out here, and it didn't touch the rim. That's a three-pointer. Who's the best now, Connor? Saturday afternoon, we were at Railroad Junction Park, and we were the crazy ones. Outdoors in the August 105 degree heat, shooting hoops. Ethan and I weren't alone. Connor shot with us, 
and a couple of friends from Ethan's complex, Thad and Sean. We got together usually every Saturday or Sunday, whichever Ethan had off. Look out, ladies and gentlemen. Five sweaty, shirtless, college-age guys are on display. Admit it. The ladies would go after Ethan. I guess ambulance drivers must meet a fitness standard, because Ethan looked like he could easily pass. How many guys have defined six-packs? I don't, and neither do Connor, Thad, and Sean. We're not fat, but we're not defined like Ethan was. The late afternoon light made Ethan's tattoo stand out. An intricate floral strand that circled his right arm and shoulder with a hummingbird on the back of his shoulder. My best friend is a Greek statue. I'm not the littlest bit jealous. I lied to myself. Lucky shot, Connor said, and bounced the ball to Ethan. If you can't do it again, you have to invent raspberry cheesecake brownies and make them for me. You're on, Ethan said, catching the ball and holding it still. He eyed the hoop and bounced the ball a couple of times. Shoot it, I yelled. Winter's coming. Ethan ignored me and concentrated. He lifted the ball, squinted at the basket, and prepared to shoot. And shot. The ball sailed. It hit the rim, rolled a little, and fell in. Made it. Ethan said. No, you didn't. The other shot didn't touch the rim. This one did. You couldn't repeat it, Thad said, running out and grabbing the ball. Would you use real raspberries, or would you use jam? I made the shot, and all of you are jealous of my skill, Ethan said. It was luck, and we all know it, I said. Thad bounced the ball to Sean, who held it while we talked. Come on, guys, don't be haters. It was a good shot, Ethan said. I don't care. You're still making brownies. Would you use jam or fresh fruit, Connor said. If I made the brownies, I'd probably use jam because it's already thickened, Ethan said. I can taste them already, Sean said. Too bad you won't get any. I made the shot, Ethan said. My phone buzzed on the bench where we stored our shirts and water bottles, our phones, and a spare couple of balls. I ran over to my gear and immediately got depressed. Incoming text from Cindy Wilson. Smiley face emoji. I'm leaving to run an errand and then head for Mama Italiana's. Wish you had sent me a picture. It's not too late. See you there. Heart emoji. Who, Cindy? Ethan asked. Mom set me up on a blind date tonight with her co-worker and never cared if I had other plans. I don't want to go, I said. Didn't you tell your mom no? Thad said. Over and over again, I said. But you have to know my mom. Did you text Cindy back? Connor asked. I didn't know what to say, so no, I didn't, I said. Wednesday night, Mom kept calling me about it, told Cindy I would call her, and gave Cindy my number so she could text me. Cindy's been texting me daily ever since. I got sick of Mom bothering me because it caused problems, so I blocked her. Wednesday night? Problems? Connor said, looking at Ethan. Sound familiar? Ethan took a step back folded his arms, and he looked at me. It does. I made a mistake. I wasn't ever going to tell Ethan about this, but Cindy's timing was lousy. Pete, Sean said, you really know how to screw up your life. I'm really good at it, I agreed. You have to go meet her, Connor said. There is nothing worse than being stood up, especially on a blind date. I have to agree, Thad said. A first date doesn't mean there will be a second. Just pick your nose or talk about your ex as if you're still dating her, and then Cindy won't want to see you again. You've never met my mom. She'll bug me about dating Cindy over and over. 
Besides, I can't go. There isn't time to go home, shower, and get changed, I said. Ethan stared at me and smiled. This is just like Melissa. Coward, you were too scared to talk to her back in high school and too scared not to. This is different. Cindy's at least 10 years older than me. Look. I pulled up Cindy's earlier text with the picture. See? My friends all crowded around and looked. Maybe she likes younger men, Connor said. Seriously, younger men, Sean said. Pete's become a boy toy, Thad said, clapping me on the back. Maybe she's rich and will buy you lots of presents. It seems to me that you, my friend, need a wingmate on this date, Connor said. Don't worry, guys. Ethan to the rescue, Ethan said, smirking. Why do I feel like I'm going to hate this, I said. Because you will, Sean said. Not if I can do something about this first, I said, suddenly having an idea. Let's see if we can scare her off. Ethan, get in the picture with me. Hello, I am half naked, Ethan said. We both are, I said. I don't know about this, Connor said. Ethan, be crazy, like we're a couple of high school kids goofing off. Cindy will see that I'm so young and immature, she'll immediately dump me, I said. You're sure about that, Ethan said, going cross-eyed and blowing his cheeks out and using his fingers to make his eyes really big. On three, I said, one, two, three. Photobomb, Thad yelled, and he and Connor and Sean jumped in. The selfie was a disaster. I had the stupidest startled expression. Ethan looked like a swearing chicken. Connor was blurred out which was probably a good thing because I think he flipped off the camera. Sean and Thad kissed in the background. I guess they're entitled. They are married. None of us were wearing shirts. All of us were sweaty, and we all looked very immature. A picture of five shirtless weird guys on a basketball court. That's what you wanted, Ethan said. Not quite, but it's perfect, I said. We definitely look young. That picture is my new background. Send it to me, Sean said. We should have had our dogs in it, Thad said. Pepperoni loves getting her picture taken. Next time. Step one done, I said. Step two. I'll tell her I was playing basketball with the boys and lost track of time. I'll be there but 15 minutes late. She won't want to wait for a young kid and will leave. I sent it. See, no reply, I said. I'm safe. We picked up the balls, our shirts, and our stuff, and headed for the cars. Cindy texted, I'll be waiting. Which one is you? My perfect plan didn't work, I said. That grabbed my phone, and before I could stop him, he texted, The cute one. Now she'll think I'm young and stuck on myself, I said. Don't worry about it. Let's get Prince Charming ready for the ball, Ethan said. Anyone know if Mama Italiana's has a dance floor? Sorry, it doesn't. Pete has to make words with his mouth. You know, conversation, Sean said. That, if we hurry, we can shower, change, and go to Mama Italiana's for the show. I'm in the mood for salsa, and Lupe's has a dance floor, Thad said, and kissed his husband. Or we could turn our phones off and stay home, Sean said, and kissed Thad. And order out. Thad said, and throw all our clothes in the laundry. With our air conditioning, we will get cold, Sean said. I guess we'll have to share a blanket, Thad said. I pretended not to notice the slight grin on Sean's face. Pete, speaking of clothes, what kind of clothes do you have, Ethan said. Oh, crap. Does that mean Ethan wants to come over to my place? I have to keep him from doing that. I don't have anything to wear, I said. Wash day is tomorrow. Good thing I have something you can wear, Ethan said. Connor, Thad, Sean, wish us luck. Thanks for listening, everybody. Just for fun, what is the weirdest thing you own? Leave a comment below. For me, 
It's an old set of expensive purple headphones that supposedly had great sound quality. The problem? I didn't notice that they were designed for kids when I bought them. They pinch my ears and make them ache whenever I use them. I don't know why I haven't thrown them out. Anyway, peace everybody. And see you next week.